George, we're gonna get started. How about that? Okay, you ready? <laughs> Good evening. I think we're going to get started. Okay. Again, good evening. Uh, I'm Carlo Parente, and on behalf of the Department of Architectural Science, I'd like to welcome you here uh, at Ryerson. Um, I'd like you to welcome you to the book launch and panel discussion for Canadian Modern Architecture 1967 to the Present with Elsa Lam. Uh, George Capellas and Marco Polo. Uh, we are grateful to hold this event here in Toronto, which is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. Uh, the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee uh, that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into the treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It's in this spirit that we'd like to welcome you here tonight. Uh, before we begin, um, the lecture is being recorded um, and will be posted on the department website. We'd ask that you put your phones on silent mode for the duration of the panel. Uh, following the panel, there'll be a reception um, with books available in the atrium area. Um, so we'd encourage you to mingle and um, buy a book and potentially have them signed by our authors. Um, this evening, Elsa, Lam will be moderating the panel discussion. Elsa is an architectural writer and historian. She co-edited um, the book tonight. Um, she's also the editor of the Canadian uh, Architect magazine, and we're also lucky to have her teaching an architectural writing course this semester here at the university. Um, I'd like to invite Elsa to uh, introduce the panel formally. Thanks so much, Carlo, and uh, and welcome. Thank you for all for uh, coming and spending your Thursday night uh, here. Uh, so, uh, so I, I think the other panelists are well known to you, uh, George Capellas and uh, and Marco Polo, uh, who have both uh, expanded considerably on research that they've done in the past um, uh, as contributors to this book. Uh, so, what I, I will do is I'm going to launch into a kind of um, I'm going to present basically just an overview of uh, of this book and uh, what its contents are and uh, why we're so excited to to have this book out in the world and. Uh, and, uh, and to be able to be talking about it tonight. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna invite um, Marco first to present uh, his uh, research on, uh, on the, uh, the projects that took, uh, took place around 1967 uh, and uh, the Centennial Projects um, for Canada. Uh, and then George Capellas is going to present some of his research on uh, civic architecture across Canada, a very small topic that we uh, assigned him and that he gracefully accepted to, uh, to write about. Um, and then we'll kind of convene for an informal discussion between the three of us and open up the floor to some questions uh, from you guys um, about either the content of the book or uh, and the content of the chapters or the making of the book or anything else that, uh, that you're curious to, uh, to hear about. So I'll just get started. So, uh, so th books are kind of complex creatures, as I've learned, and they, uh, they require a lot of support. Uh, so uh, we are very grateful to, uh, to the kind of in-kind support of Canadian Architect, to a major grant from the Canada Council for the Arts that made this book possible, um, and to the sponsorship of the Ontario Association of Architects uh, that enabled us to host all of these talks uh, in many places in Ontario. Um, and there's also talks that are happening in other places in Canada. Uh, the Alberta Association of Architects, REIC, PCL, and Architects Alliance have also uh, been generous sponsors in this whole project of making and touring a book. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the institutional support of the Ryerson uh, University Library and Archives. Uh, when we have the reception uh, portion of, of this event, and then be sure to take a look at the photographs that are displayed in the lobby. Uh, there's um, many of the images uh, in this book were taken from the Ryerson uh, University Library's collection of, uh, of images that were shown in, uh, that were, that, that came originally from Canadian Architect Magazine, in fact. Um, and then we donated like these boxes of photographs and slides and negatives to the, the library who magically have been in this 
involved in this process of converting them to you know, things that you can actually search, things that are scanned online, and things that have been a tremendous resource, uh, both for making a book like this, but also for other kinds of scholarly research and uh, for students and the whole architecture community. Now, this is a pretty short list. I mean, the longer list of thanks that we have looks more like this. Um, so, the, you know, Ryerson University is up there, as, as well as you know, a slew of other institutions that helped us with getting material together for this book. Um, and industry supporters, um, architecture offices, uh, who, uh, who dug through their archives to help us find photos and also helped to uh, give us permission to use photos that, uh, that, that where they had maybe negotiated the rights already with photographers. And the photographers themselves, in some cases, um, you know, we talked directly to photographers and, and, and asked for uh, images of, of buildings uh, to include in this book. Um, both of the co-editors, Graham Livesey and I, come from an architecture background, uh, so having really, really good photos in this book was uh, a huge priority for us. Uh, so the task of writing about uh, Canadian architecture uh, came about, um, I, you know, this project started about six years ago, and um, Graham approached me, and at the time, it, the, uh, the question was, well, you know, Canadian architects started in 1955. At that time, we were approaching 2015. And he said, well, you know, we should really do something about Canadian architect. It's been around for 60 years. You know, why don't we do like a, you know, best of Canadian architect or something? We'll go through all the old issues, get the articles, major projects, and compile something. So, you know, we both went through this process of looking through all of the back set of Canadian Architect uh, and making all kinds of lists about, uh, about the projects that were covered in it. And then when we got to the end of that process, we realized that the book that we wanted to write wasn't about Canadian Architect at all. It was actually about Canadian architecture uh, over this time span. And the, the right start date wasn't 1955 when Canadian Architect was started, but it was actually 1967 this year in which the, this incredible effort was made uh, towards uh, using architecture as a tool for building up the national identity of Canada and the year of yeah, Expo 67, which, uh, which you know maybe some of the older people in this uh, room were, were fortunate enough to even attend as kids. Um, uh, but this major moment of nature building for Canada that that really had architecture at the heart of it um, we also had to figure out how to tell the story about architecture I mean you know again the kind of obvious way to tell it would be maybe a chronological account you know start from 1967 talk about the 60s and the 70s and 80s and so on until we got up to the present um, and then the other kind of obvious approach would be more of a regional approach uh, you know talk about what happened uh, in different parts of Canada and how how the evolution of architecture has happened in those areas but we, we felt that that regional approach had already been taken and that that was a story that was pretty familiar. You know, we're, we've, there was this amazing series of, of kind of Canadian modern exhibitions that happened, you know, around uh, modern architecture in Toronto, in Winnipeg, and, you know, and so forth, Atlantic Canada. And so we felt that that ground was kind of covered already, and that that was, in a way, a familiar story, and a story that didn't really tell the whole, uh, cover the whole breadth of what was happening in Canadian architecture since, since this time. So we did a very kind of, you know, we, we hedged our bets in a way. We didn't take one story and we decided to, uh, to take four storylines. Uh, one that was about kind of national movements in architecture and attempts to create a kind of national architecture. Um, another section was about international influences, uh, so ways that you know, Canada you know, interacted with the other world and was participated in trends that were, uh, that ha were happening uh, globally and also led some of these trends uh, at certain moments in time. Uh, we wanted to talk about regional responses, which is a little bit of the regional story, uh, which is, in the end, important, but you know, just not the whole story. And then we thought we'd talk about centers of influence. We'd talk about the major cities of Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal, and how those have had an impact on architecture culture in the country. So, like I said, I'm going to give you kind of like a flyover of all of these, uh, of all of this content, and then we'll do this deeper dive into, into George and Marco's contributions. So under na national contributions, I mean, it was completely obvious to uh, to approach Marco, uh, Marco, uh, Marco Polo and Colin Ripley to ask them to write about the Centennial Projects, since it's been a subject of research that they've been deeply involved in for the past couple of years. And uh, and, and this is basically the story of you know how Canada embarked on this uh, incredibly ambitious project of building uh, major projects uh, in each uh, in each province of the country, um, and you know and then you know smaller projects throughout uh, the uh, the nation to celebrate the hundredth anniversary of Canada in 1967 and the kind of architecture that resulted from that. It's also the 
story of, 19, of Expo 67 and that incredible uh, festival and the energy that that brought uh, and the attention that that brought to Canada at that moment in time. Uh, George tackled national movements in or he tackled civic architecture in uh, in uh, in Canada. And as he'll uh, as he'll talk about, uh, this is the story um, of national museums, kind of at the first on the first layer. Uh, but then it's also the story of other kinds of uh, of of places where Canada had the task of using architecture to represent the nation as a whole. Uh, so the Olympic Games that have happened in uh, Vancouver, Calgary, and Montreal, um, the embassies. That, uh, that have uh, that represent Canada abroad, and and then you know the city halls that represent Ca uh, Canada's kind of multi-layered uh, governance structure um, all through Canada, and that have a kind of unique kind of presence in many towns. Uh, Lisa Landrum uh, uh, wrote about campus architecture, and we kind of stretched her timeline a little bit here because uh, she chose to focus on a number of seminal projects that happened uh, just before 1967 for the most part. Uh, so she was uh, interested in how these projects uh, really set the groundwork for what would follow in the development of campus architecture in this period when, uh, when, when Canada's universities and colleges were really, were really booming. Uh, so she looked at John Andrews Andrews, uh, Scarborough, uh, Scarborough, Scarborough College, uh, the two projects by Ron Tom, Massey College, as well as Trent University in Peterborough. In Peterborough. And uh, she looked at Erickson and Massey's uh, Simon Fraser University um, down near Vancouver. Uh, Odile No, I'm so uh, thrilled about this chapter, actually. Um, Odile No did an amazing job of, of of tracing the kind of history of indigenous architecture um, in, in during this in during the modern and contemporary period in Canada, um, and uh, she tells a story that goes from uh, from you know really a couple of key figures Etienne Gaboury and um, and and Douglas Cardinal and so forth uh, you know working uh, on on uh, on pieces with indigenous communities and or, or key pieces. I guess initially, I should say four indigenous communities, and then gradually tracing this history uh, to places where indigenous communities have become more involved in the process, um, and then you know to the present day where we're kind of on this verge of a transition where uh, indigenous architects are starting to become a more strongly uh, nurtured presence in Canada and are beginning to uh, to lead designs of their own and 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 uh, and transform uh, the architecture for their communities. Um, under international influences, uh, the kind of second chapter of this book, we were really interested in, uh, in how Canada interacted uh, with other uh, major movements that took place in this time period. Because you know, no country really exists in, in isolation from others, especially in this era. And uh, the obvious place to start was to look at megastructures and high tech. And I, for those that you know that that uh, that have you know, for those that are younger in the room, you know, it's it maybe less obvious that Canada was um, an incredibly. Um, was seen as really the the kind of leader internationally in this kind of in this movement of of developing megastructural architecture. Uh, Rainer Banham, a prominent architectural historian and theorist, uh, wrote a book on megastructures in which you know, Canada was Canadian projects were first and foremost in that book. Um, and some of those projects uh, would be familiar to you. Um, the University of Lethbridge still has this kind of commanding presence, an iconic presence, as uh, as a building that is uh, the kind of definition of megastructure. Is you know, a building that kind of aspires to be like almost like a city in itself. Um, so you know, so that you can see even just from that iconic photo, that kind of presence that the the main university building has. Um, and then there's you know other projects. It's not only uh, the book is not only a story of you know, or a com compilation of success stories. I mean, some of these projects have more of a mixed legacy too, uh, such as the McMaster Health Sciences Center, uh, where there was an incredibly bold idea about creating a um, a hospital where you could, where you'd have interstitial floors that were purposely made to house the equipment, uh, the, all the mechanical equipment, so that you could easily swap this out and expand the hospital and update it. Um, of course, this particular building has not been really maintained with that kind of uh, with that kind of legacy in mind. So you know, so it has a kind of stranger presence 
Um, other projects by Craig Seidler and Strong have fared uh, better. Ontario Place among them, which, uh, which the Toronto community is working very hard to, uh, to keep as a, a public place and to keep those original structures in place right now. Uh, Larry Richards uh, looked at postmodernism. I mean, some of these projects were, these chapters were a little bit complicated because we were asking people that were involved in these movements to, to write about them in a way. Uh, but, uh, Larry Richards did an amazing job of unpacking this, this period in an architecture which, you know, uh, which strangely is kind of ha coming, having a bit of a resurgence now uh, with the exhibitions and books coming out of the CCA and other kinds of studies about this period. And his argument is basically that the kind of um, cartoonish kind of versions of postmodernism that we often see associated with the states um, played out quite differently in Canada. Uh, I mean, Mississauga City Hall was an incredibly iconic uh, part of this movement, but other buildings have a kind of postmodern influence on them, but aren't over the top. They're, they're actually quite sensitive to their place uh, and their culture, the way that postmodernism was actually meant to be um, when it was first theorized. Uh, so places like uh, the YMCA here in Toronto or, um, or like the CCA in Toronto, the Canadian Centre for Architecture, which has a postmodern presence, uh, but is by no means a kind of frivolous building. Um, Ian Chodakoff, who would, would also be familiar to this school, is uh, uh, studied urban revitalization. Uh, so he looked at major redevelopment projects that happened in uh, several cities across Canada, um, particularly uh, Granville Island and the Woodward's development in Vancouver, um, the Evergreen Brickworks development here in Toronto, uh, and St. Lawrence Market here, and uh, and. Uh, uh, several projects in Montreal as well, uh, notably Benny Farm by Liff. And he was really interested in how architects um, took a, you know, found a place and a role in these incredibly complex projects that involved many, many actors and many different kinds of, um, of, of, of civic agencies uh, to, to, to re-envisage parts of the city fabric. Uh, Steve Minnell, uh, we asked him, he, at the time, he, he's, a, he's an architect who uh, now teaches, uh, leads the College of Sustainability out at Dalhousie University in uh, Halifax. And he's been involved in studying some of the very early uh, sustainability projects in Canada. Um, he was involved in studying this project that was uh, this kind of fantastic project out in PEI called the PEI Arc, which was a self-sustaining house for a family of four um, with, you know, with a greenhouse and ponds for growing fish and a whole like composting system so that it was really conceived like an ark, you know, on, a, on the water where you could, you could live inside this, this, this I mean, a metaphorical bubble in a way um, for, you know, indefinitely. Um, and, and he uh, enlightened, uh, he brought to the book uh, kind of history of all these early sustainability projects in Canada, uh, which are really fascinating. I mean, Canada was uh, Canada's first, the first passive house in the world is a Canadian project, the, Saskat the Saskatchewan Conservation House, um, built with no furnace um, in the 70s. And um, he also uncovered projects uh, like this one done for a First Nations community in Manitoba uh, that reused uh, local materials like telephone poles for the structure. So really innovative things that, you know, we talk about now, but actually have roots that go quite far back in uh, Canada's history, um, as well as tracing that history, of course, to the present, di um, present uh, dialogues about sustainability. Under regional responses, uh, we start on the west coast in Vancouver. Uh, Sherry McKay, who teaches at UBC, or who taught at UBC, she's retired now, um, looked at how um, often the uh, the story of, of Canadian modern architecture, I should say, starts with the story of the West Coast houses and these kind of incredibly innovative and sensitive uh, houses that were built in these you know, landscapes bordering the forest and bordering the Georgia Strait. And what she was interested in uh, with this chapter is how those architects that built those houses uh, went on in a certain moment to be building major, major structures in the city of Toronto. And uh, she wanted to examine how they brought their understanding of landscape and you know, different kinds of land claims uh, to the city fabric when they moved from that residential scale to this larger institutional and city building scale. Uh, Graham Livesey, the co-editor in the book, is based out in Calgary. Uh, so he looked at uh, the prairie, uh, the architecture of the prairies, and iconic structure by uh, the, um, the uh, Clifford Re Weens, who recently passed away, um, as well as, of course, the amazing structures by Douglas Cardinal and a slew of others. 
uh, Brian Carter, our, our one non-Canadian contributor to the book. Uh, he's had a long affiliation with Dalhousie University, so we thought that he would be a great pick to write about the East Coast architecture and uh, the developments there uh, and give, bring a bit of an outside perspective to that. Um, his chapter actually, uh, interestingly, uh, focused largely around um, the impact of Dalhousie and the impact, uh, in particular, of Brian McKay Lyons um, on the architecture in that region over the past few decades. Uh, Lola Shepard and Mason White uh, um, have a uh, kind of experimental practice, a research-based practice uh, that studies the north of Canada. Uh, so they looked at Arctic Canada and the challenges, the particular uh, peculiar kind of challenges and, um, and opportunities of building in that uh, incredibly harsh uh, and logistically complex environment. Um, and you know, looking at practices that go back to the 70s that were working with on-site prefab um, panels in the north and uh, other kinds of, you know, um, opportunities to blend architecture and landscape design up in the north. And then the final section of the book, and then I'll, I'll pass the mic over to, to, uh, to Marco and then to, to George, um, is about centers of influence. Uh, so, uh, so David Theodore looked at the architecture of Quebec, and in particular, he centered in on the idea of the kind of competition culture in Quebec um, and how that's shaped the architecture in that province. And this kind of intersection of, of competition, uh, the, the kind of conservation of existing buildings, and how that plays out in the cultural realm, since the, uh, the competitions largely apply to cultural sector buildings in Quebec. Um, I take a look at uh, the, uh, the evolution of architecture in Toronto, uh, going back to, uh, to Toronto City Hall and the kinds of uh, people that that brought to the city, as well as the architectural ideas that that brought to the city. Um, and, you know, and looking at uh, how the, the landscape, as obscured as it becomes in the city, um, has influenced the evolution of architecture here as well. And then the last chapter is Adele Weeder, who takes us back to Vancouver uh, to look at the, the evolution of work since Expo uh, 86 in Vancouver, uh, looking at the, the impact of firms like Busby and Associates, and also firms like the Podcasts, who work, work both in the city and, uh, and also in the growing centers that are, are, are developing outside of the city. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Marco to take us through uh, a bit more of an in-depth uh, view of the Centennial Projects. Thanks. Thanks, Elsa. Thanks for the introduction, but mostly thanks for inviting us to participate in this incredible project, um, which I guess you've discovered is just as difficult and time-consuming as building a hospital, um, <laughs> given the timeline. Um, I have to acknowledge, of course, my uh, partner in this, uh, my co-author and, and partner in this research, Colin Ripley, who can't be with us here this evening. Um, this project actually has its roots as far back as 2011 when we got our first research grant for this work. Um, and so we know what it's like to build a hospital out of an exhibition. Um, so this, this had a first life as an exhibition. And I also want to acknowledge um, a couple of former students who I see here tonight who were very uh, made very important contributions to that early research. Mitchell May, who's here, and David Campbell. So thank you very much. This still has legs, so that's great. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to start by just reading a brief excerpt from our chapter to kind of set the stage for the, for the discussion. Uh, so bear with me. Um, on the evening of June 2nd, 1969, a crowd of Ottawa dignitaries, including Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, and Governor General Roland Michener arrived at the brand new National Arts Centre, one of the last of the centennial projects commissioned by the government to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Canadian Confederation. A festive atmosphere settled over the gala for the official opening of the building, coming almost two years after the actual 1967 centennial. Sitting in stark contrast to nearby buildings, the message of the National Arts Centre, with its brutalist exteriors, its orientation away from the fabric of the city, and its hexagonal plan was clear, if not entirely comfortable, for Ottawa residents. Canada and Canadian culture would be about the future, about new forms and new ideas. The performance that awaited the sold out audience in Southam Hall, the largest stage in the facility, pushed the boundaries of newness further still. The main work on the program was a full length ballet, Crenerg commissioned for the opening and choreographed by National Ballet Director Roland Petit. 
Written by the avant-garde composer and architect, Yanis Zanakis, Krenerg was, as historian Jim Hartley puts it, an aggressively modern, highly abstract dialogue on the ideological disorders facing the world. A world based in the upheavals of the time um, in 1968 and 1969, when the uh, uh, composition was, was written. The set design by Victor Vasarely was equally abstract and stridently modern. The whole production was a work of ambitious avant-garde art connected to contemporary politics on the highest international level. Looking back on that evening across 50 years of intervening history, we could well ask, how had Canada become so modern? Now, at least part of the answer is held in this document, um, the Massey Report, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, commissioned in 1949. Um, uh, and established as the Royal Commission on National Development in the Arts, Letters, and Sciences, uh, named for its, uh, or you know, commonly known as the Massey Report after uh, Vincent Massey, who was the uh, chairman of the commission, um, was a, quite an extraordinary document that uh, looked to position Canada uh, with a new identity in the post-war period. So Canada was emerging from the Second World War um, uh, and the whole world, of course, had been, had been profoundly transformed. Canada's emerging on the world stage, looking to shed its colonial identity and looking for a distinct identity um, uh, in the face of this extraordinary cultural presence that the United States was establishing around the world. So there was a you know, fair amount of, of insecurity and soul searching and trying to figure out what was the Canada of the future. Um, and, uh, this was quite an extraordinary document that made some very significant recommendations that have had uh, profound influence on a number of, of, uh, of cultural sectors within the country. Um, and that, uh, in fact, one could say is responsible for the you know, pr products like this book and the research that we do because it's out of the uh, Massey Report that we have the establishment of the Canada Council for the Arts, for example. Um, it also led to uh, expanded roles for the National Film Board, the National Gallery, funding to universities, etc. Now, the Massey Report devoted a scant six of its roughly 500 pages explicitly to architecture and urban planning. Within those pages, the report suggested that all important buildings should be designed in open competition. More importantly, the Commission accepted the observation presented to it by its panel of architectural experts that architecture was at best poorly understood by the general public, stating that there was general agreement between non-professional groups, professional architects, and government agencies that it is of the first importance to arouse public interest and develop public understanding on a matter of such universal consequence. On the heels of the Massey Report, the 1950s saw the construction of a significant number of cultural facilities. The list Excuse me. The list of important cultural faci facilities included the Festival Theatre in Stratford, Ontario, by Rounthwaite and Fairfield, the O'Keeffe Centre for the Performing Arts in Toronto, by Earl C. Morgan and Page and Steele Architects, with Peter Dickinson as lead designer. Two years later, the Queen Elizabeth Theatre in Vancouver, the result of a design competition won by a group of young architects from Montreal, Affleck, Debera, Dimacopoulos, Lebensold, Michaud, and Size, later known as ARCOP. <clears throat> Excuse me. As Canada became conscious of itself as a country of the new, the fast approaching centennial of Confederation became an opportunity to push several agendas forward. To this end, two Canadian prime ministers John Diefenbaker in 1960, Lester Pearson in 1964, thank you, George. Thanks very much. Address the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada annual meetings. Both prime ministers spoke about the prospects that would be made available to architects in relation to the upcoming centennial. The prime ministers elaborated on how the centennial, <coughs> excuse me, related to nation building and on the vital role that architecture had to play. Diefenbaker discussed the similarity between building buildings and building nations asking for a poetic response from the architects involved in the centennial. Something to touch the hearts of Canadians. Something to represent the unity of our country. Something to embody the paradox of two great national stocks which join together to make confederation possible. Something that will well represent the tremendous contributions of persons from all races and creeds who have come to Canada from all parts of the world. No small order. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Pearson spoke along similar lines, although he was even more explicit in his view that architecture had the job of making Canada the country of the future, and that the unity of English and French Canadians was at stake. Without equal opportunities for all our people and provinces, there can be no other foundation for national unity, he told the audience of gathered architects. The message was clear. The centennial would be used to create a new and united Canada, and architecture would be a key tool in achieving this goal. So since the Massey Report and, the following, and following the clear message of Diefenbaker and Pearson's addresses to the RAIC, this orientation to the future had been central to all discussions about building a national identity. If the centennial was about recognizing the diverse contributions of the various peoples that came together to form Canada, it was equally, and perhaps even more importantly, about forging out of those diverse experiences a common vision and identity. Now, at first glance, the Centennial Building suggests that they were less about memorializing and recognizing Canada's first hundred years than about imagining and building its foundation for the next hundred. The Fathers of Confederation Memorial Building in Charlottetown, the first Centennial project to be completed, created an important precedent for those that would follow, particularly with respect to the formal and expressive qualities of the ensemble, but also in terms of its commitment to the new. Now, what you see here is a picture of the uh, competition-winning model. Um, that is um, architect Dimitri Dimakopoulos um, with uh, John Diefenbaker at the uh, announcement of the, of the winning scheme. Now, the elements of uh, Dimakopoulos' project are expressed as discrete buildings rising from a podium elevated above street level. The new buildings are clad in Wallace sandstone from the same Nova Scotia quarry that supplied the stone for Province House, which is adjacent to this complex in Charlottetown. <clears throat> Excuse me. While this uh, material treatment, as well as the height of the new complex, defer to the historic Province House and the intimate scale of Charlottetown, the complex as a whole suggests a more aloof attitude to its small town setting. The massing does not address the surrounding streets, instead defining a fortress that protectively envelops its activities. This sense of separation is further emphasized by the podium, which isolates the memorial buildings in their constructed landscape, as well as by their uncompromisingly abstract formal composition. On the heels of their success with the Fathers of Confederation memorial buildings, Affleck, Debora, Dimakopoulos, Levensold, and Saez received the commission for a building that would serve as the flagship of the Centennial Projects and the nation's premier cultural performance venue. For the National Arts Centre project, led by partner Fred Levensold, the architects elaborated on themes already developed in the Charlottetown project, creating a series of discrete performance spaces that were clearly expressed as distinct buildings emerging from a series of terraces. However, where the Father of Confederation Memorial Building's modernity is tempered by their nod to context through scale and material treatment, the National Arts Centre unabashedly turns its back on the city, on the built context of Ottawa, to instead engage the Rideau Canal. In addition, its embrace of the rugged language of textured concrete in various forms places it squarely in the brutalist tradition, expressing a break in historic continuity. The entry sequence eschews the formal frontal approach typical of performance spaces in favor of a distributed, interconnected system of multi-leveled lobbies expressing the project more as a constructed landscape than as a conventional building form. There you can see, this is actually a very carefully uh, staged photograph. Um, the, the actual physical space is not nearly as compressed as it appears in this photo. This is, this is clearly set up to give the impression that the building is sitting in a, in a, in a landscape where, in fact, there's much more uh, of a kind of urban context at, between this foreground and the, and the buildings beyond. So very carefully orchestrated um, um, representations of the project to emphasize its role as a piece of landscape. Some view, a view of the, uh, one of the uh, interiors, <clears throat> the main interior lobby. The new was also evident in art installations associated with the National Arts Centre. Uh, you can see also this, this very strong kind of graphic identity and the use of a strong um, and unconventional geometry as a way of distinguishing the building from more traditional forms of architecture. And the repetitive uh, 
uh, um, uh, nature of that geometry and showing up in all the, all the National Art Center's um, uh, promotional materials as well. Not unrelated to the uh, triangulated um, uh, maple leaf that uh, I think is probably familiar to all of us, to those of us of a certain age, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So the building and its grounds were filled with contemporary Canadian art, including Micheline Beauchemin's magnificent stage curtain in Southern Hall, the enormous cast aluminum doors by uh, Jordi Bonnet leading into the salon, William Martin's crystal DNA chandeliers in each of the building's hexagonal stairways, and a massive bronze sculpture on the roof terrace by Charles Dodelin. The National Art Center was one of several centennial projects that commissioned significant artworks to articulate national and regional narratives, and again to reinforce the, uh, this very kind of um, uh, committed modernity uh, represented both in the buildings and the artworks. The Fathers of Confederation Memorial Buildings and the National Art Center demonstrate two primary modes in which the centennial projects approached and expressed the new. First, both projects manifest in their programs what could be called a constructive futurity. This mode is in keeping with the aims of Diefenbaker and Pearson to encourage the development of a unique and mature Canadian culture through the construction of important institutional buildings. The provision of performance spaces, galleries, and libraries was a critical component of this cultural infrastructure. Second, both projects embraced an architectural futurity. That is, rather than looking back to precedents or working from the position of memorialization, the projects engaged with current and even futuristic modes of architectural thinking. This includes brutalism, as can be seen in the form and materiality of the projects, and systems thinking, as can be seen in their organization. Furthermore, both projects considered how these architectural tropes could be usefully applied to the Canadian context, creating a specifically Canadian architectural modernity. Other centennial projects took on the theme of the future in a more literal way. The most extreme of these was the world's first UFO landing pad built by the town of St. Paul, Alberta to the design of engineer Alex Mayer. St. Paul established its reputation as Centennial Town Canada by pursuing over 100 centennial projects of various scales and types, from the renaming of streets after the Fathers of Confederation to the production of 6,000 centennial toques. <coughs> Uh, the construction of the UFO landing pad, an official centennial project opened on June 3, 1967 by Minister of National Defense Paul Hellyer, complete with a flyover by Canadian Air Force jet fighters, was the quirkiest of the town's projects. The landing pad includes a map of Canada <coughs> composed of stones from each province and territory. Although the project was built in commemoration of Canada's centennial, it had an international, even intergalactic aim. A plaque at the site reads, the area under the world's first UFO landing pad was designated international by the town of St. Paul as a symbol of our faith that mankind will maintain the outer universe free from national wars and strife. The future travel in space will be safe for all, <coughs> excuse me, for all intergalactic beings. All visitors from Earth or otherwise are welcome to this territory and to the town of St. Paul. A direct interest in futurity can also be seen in a set of more mainstream projects that embrace the space age. Gerald Hamilton's Centennial Planetarium and Museum in Vancouver, Macmillan Long and Associates, Calgary Centennial Planetarium, and Raymond Moriyama's Ontario Science Centre. We can also see in the representations of some of these projects this fascination and and commitment to this uh, um, uh, representation of modernity and currency. This is a you know absolutely sort of state of the art, latest possible uh, kind of design um, sensibility, and it's often uh, represented with uh, you know youthful models um, to again emphasize the kind of currency and hipness of these buildings and of the culture that they are representing. Uh, it's a very important to note, I think, that in 1967. 50% of the population of Canada was under 25. So this is not just hype. <laughs> this was a young country, a future-oriented country, and it's very much expressed in um, these, uh, these projects and the representation of these projects. And then, of course, there's Expo. <clears throat> 
As already mentioned, the orientation to modernity and the future represented by the Centennial Buildings were central to discussions about the establishment of a national identity in the wake of the 1951 publication of the Massey Report. With this remarkable building program was, while this, sorry, while this remarkable building program was primarily directed at a domestic audience, the drive to build the new was also an unmistakable purpose of the most ambitious of the projects completed in Canada for the Centennial, an undertaking that addressed the world stage, Expo 67. It remains the first thing most Canadians think of in relation to 1967. It was, of course, a blockbuster. Peter C. Newman described it as follows. The greatest thing we have ever done as a nation. <clears throat> the more you see of it, the more you're overwhelmed by a feeling that if this, that it is, if this is possible, that if this little sub-Arctic, self-obsessed country of 20 million people can put on this kind of show, then it can do almost anything. While a spirit of experimentation permeated the architecture of Expo 67, including that of smaller industry pavilions, such as this one, Man in Color, or this uh, polymer pavilion, uh, remarkably by Ron Tom, I don't think recognizable as any other Ron Tom project we've ever seen. Anything was possible at Expo 67, I suppose. Um, but in addition to these, there were also um, some major structures that emerged as emblematic icons of the World's Fair. This is the Canadian Pavilion by, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Ashworth, Robbie, Vaughan, and Williams, uh, which was the successor firm to Peter Dickinson. The familiar US Pavilion in the form of a giant geodesic dome designed by Richard Buckminster Fuller. Moshe Safdie's Habitat 67, a village of precast concrete modules representing a bold experiment in prefabricated housing and the experimental tensile roof of Fry Otto and Rolf uh, Gutbrot's West German Pavilion. And of course also the rigorous tetrahedral geometry of ARCOP's Man the Explorer and Man the Producer theme pavilions. ARCOP's two theme pavilions at Expo 67, designed under the, under the direction of Guy Debarat, reflect some of the same geometric preoccupations that led to the hexagonal plan forms at Lebensold's National Arts Center. Oops. Um, the pavilions indulged fully in the architectural rhetoric of the tetrahedral structural frame. Reiner Banham's enthusiastic descriptions of Man the Producer include a comparison, meant as a compliment, to a collapsed and rusting Eiffel Tower, while also calling it a prototype of the multi-level city centers of the future. Inside Expo 67's actual pavilions, each country showcased innovative technologies, often with an emphasis on space exploration, transportation, and communications. And it has been noted that critics were alternately frustrated and fascinated by the way in which the architectural spaces had been eclipsed by the programming in them, and by how sound and image had been deployed in the creation of a new kind of total environment. This notion of the future of architecture as a media-saturated environment reflected the vision of Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan, who had published two essays in The Canadian Architect in 1961 and 1966. In these prescient articles, McLuhan argued that the most important environments were increasingly not the physical spaces themselves, but rather the invisible information environments created by new electronic media. Little did he know. Uh, this emerged as a common theme at Expo 67 with numerous multimedia installations featuring immersive projection technologies, including multi-screen theaters and other advances in audiovisual media, as well as emerging computer technologies. On the whole, the fair prefigured the information revolution of subsequent decades. In The Invisible Environment, one of the articles McLuhan penned for Canadian Architect, he argued that the really total and saturating environments are invisible. The ones we notice are quite fragmentary and insignificant compared to the ones we don't see. In the case of environments that are created by new technologies, while they are quite invisible in themselves, they do make visible the old environments. If we apply this logic to the architecture of Expo 67 and the Centennial projects, then should we surmise that the utopian modern visions expressed through the buildings of 1967 represented a version of the future whose time was already past? As Canada embraced the idea of modernity as a defining national trait, and expressed this in the forward-looking architecture of the Centennial Buildings and Expo 67, 
Modern architecture itself was coming under attack from a variety of forces, challenging the optimism that had characterized much of the post-war period. The exhortation from Prime Minister Diefenbaker to use the centennial and its representations as expressions of national unity was undermined when, on July 24, 1967, French President Charles de Gaulle caused an international incident with his exclamation, Vive le Québec libre, from a balcony at Montreal City Hall. By then, tensions between Quebec and English Canada were already high, with an increasingly militant FLQ uh, <clears throat> emerging on the scene. The youthful enthusiasm for the future that fueled the centennial fever of 1967 and the Trudeau mania of 1968 had, by the early 70s, been eroded by disappointment and cynicism. The celebratory atmosphere of the late 1960s was supplanted by the shock of the 1970 October crisis and invocation of the War Measures Act, enacted following the FLQ kidnapping of the British Trade Commissioner James Cross and the assassination of senior Quebec Cabinet Minister Pierre Laporte. The economic instability of the mid-1970s, culminating in the highly unpopular imposition of wage and price controls, further eroded the optimistic anticipation of the future that characterized the centennial year. The generous spending on cultural and educational initiatives that flourished in the 1960s gave way to an era of austerity that by the early 1980s had led to significant reductions in the budgets of institutions like the National Arts Center. Today, the centennial buildings can be read as relics of a time when architecture was, uh, excuse me, architecture was understood to play an essential role in Canadian culture. The 1982 report of the Federal Cultural Policy Review Committee, essentially a bookend to the Massey Report, noted that while the 30 years following the Massey Report were characterized by putting up buildings and establishing organizations, accomplishments that the 1982 report dismissed as relatively simple tasks that add up to more an industrial and employment policy than a cultural policy, Canada must place a new emphasis on encouraging the best use of our concert halls, theaters, cinemas, galleries, and airwaves for the presentation of Cana uh, to Canadians of the finest works of Canada's own creative artists. This expresses a view that buildings themselves have little value as cultural artifacts, but serve only as vessels for other content. In recent years, however, the recognition of the heritage value of this generation of buildings has brought their significance and their vulnerability to the fore. In the case of the Centennial Buildings, this establishes the framework for a new appreciation of how architecture has given shape to the values, aspirations, and enthusiasms that drove, that drove the development of Canada as the country entered its second century. Thanks. So I, I invite you all just to have a quick stretch, and if you need to unbundle, do so. So, um, let's see if I can make this work. So, I want to thank Elsa for, um, for inviting me um, and inviting us to present to you. It's a thrill to be here. Uh, when she asked me to participate on this panel, I thought it would be a great chance for me to think about what I had written and to consider some of the issues that it brought up. Um, some of you uh, in the class, uh, in the room, excuse me, have been in my first year <laughs> class, in the class. Some of you in this room have been students in my first year class, the Bill's context. And as you may know, I use the idea of narrative as a way for students to understand um, the various parts of the discipline of architecture. And so for me, architecture has many layers. I'm going to see if I can move this over slightly. Architecture has many layers. Um, it's about recital of facts. The narrative is part of this. Uh, sorry, narrative has many layers. You can recite some facts. You can establish a point of view. 
I can, as the storyteller, construct a point of view that I wish you to understand. It can be about the subject and the context. And we can also read into the subjects a variety of narratives. Um, in many ways, the idea of narrative can be a way to enter the discussion of institutional architecture in Canada in the past 50 years. And I realized when I was um, sitting there listening to, uh, to Marco and Elsa introduce this, my talk should have been called, Your Tax Dollars at Work. <laughs> so um, there's a story about the buildings, the architects, and so forth, how we construct them. And at the same time, and that's what I think is more interesting to me, is the idea about the way these buildings represent how we view ourselves and how this view is expressed through architecture. So it's not just about the object and the maker, it's also about context. It's about the physical place and the time in which things are done, the zeitgeist, if you will, and the ideas that they may, may represent. So when Elsa asked me to talk about public institutions, I got very excited. <laughs> and to many of you, um, I was thinking about my high school, the word institution may have very pejorative connotations, those long green painted corridors that we all uh, love to forget. We imagine lifeless and boring architecture, conformity. We uh, imagine conventionality and dullness. So it's hardly the case, I think, for Canadian institutional architecture and the architecture of Canadian institutions in the past 50 years. So here I go. At the national level, these buildings symbolize uh, a search and realization for our modern identity. They're part of an ongoing narrative, which uh, Marco has begun to ex explore or has constructed for you about um, um, that was started by the Massey Commission in the 1950s uh, to shape Canadian institutions and to use architecture as a physical embodiment of these institutions. And by implication, these institutions uh, and these institutional buildings say something about who we are and about our collectivity, what Canada is all about. So institutional culture and buildings embody, um, happens physically, it happens in, in small communities, it happens across the nation, nation it also happens virtually. Um, so it happens how we valorize and highlight activities, it happens pragmatically in the ways in which we see ourselves and we want others to see us too. So, um, my, my chapter has a number of different components. I probably have the most number of buildings of any of the chapters in, in, in the book, and thank you so much, Elsa, for, for that. But um, I'll try to give you a quick flyover of some of the ideas, some of the narratives that I think that these pre present. Um, first of all, our national capital uh, region, the importance of national institutions has been affirmed by architecture. The two galleries you see here, Safdie's National Gallery and Cardinal's Museum of History, tell the story. And it's a story that sometimes happened on a very bumpy path of the creation of permanent homes for the collections of art and artifacts of these institutions. The story of the National Gallery goes back to the early 1950s. There were three schemes, several competitions, and many sites later, the gallery was built on Nepean Point and opened to the public in 1958. The Moshe Safdie design on the left sought to reconcile historic urban architectural forms with the identity of a new cultural landmark. Across the river, the Museum of Man, which is now the Museum of History by Douglas Cardinal, was completed in 1989. These two buildings, I think, typify the often contradictory approaches to nature we see in Canadian architecture. The idea of fitting in versus standing out and of our important cultural and architectural narratives. It's one of our most important narratives, that is. The National Gallery seeks to reflect the Gothic traditions of the House of Parliament, and Safdie saw these buildings, and I quote from my chapter, actually growing out of the Ottawa River site, if you can imagine that. By contrast, Cardinal's building is organic and sinuous. It sits in the, in the site, reflecting the sculpting of the land by centuries of glaciation and comes from Cardinal's own unique approach to curvilinear architectural form. So these buildings both fit in and stand out. The spate, the spate of these new national institutions built into the 1990s and 2000s reflects a shift in narratives about our views of the past in evolving ideas of identity and an expansion of the prominence of museums in presenting many narratives to Canadians. 
new museums of that time began to look forward. The War Museum um, and the Museum of Nature, which is the next slide, both in Ottawa, are museums developed along the traditional idea of the museum, repositories of artifacts. They evolved from existing uh, museum collections. The Canadian War Museum represents a struggle between valorizing the blood and guts we spilled in national conflicts of the two world wars and Canada's most recent history of peacekeeping. Again, the building is designed to appear to grow out of its setting in Le Breton Flats. Um, and again, here it's a repetition of the nature narrative. And along with this narrative, the museum presents another idea, that being the power of space to convey a message and evoke emotion. Messages of lest we forget are inscribed in the museum's Remembrance Hall, and museum visitors are asked not only to reflect in the past, but also to look for the future. Again, a theme that Marco touched on between past and future. Here, regeneration uh, has become part of our contemporary architecture. And so regeneration is also presented by the renewal of the Canadian Museum of Nature. The design, was the design team was charged with recreating the museum's original tower, demolished in the 19-teens because it was built structurally unsound, and building a new addition. So the building represents a historical continu continuity between past and present, and the narrative of old and new architecture sets this building apart from other new museums. The third national museum uh, I highlight in my chapter represents a wholesale shift of national museums in both location and focus. Here the narrative moves from museum as repository of artifacts to museum as representation of ideology. This is the Museum of Human Rights on the right, located in Winnipeg, far from our national capital region. Its mandate is to enhance the public understanding of human rights and was built by and with support from private patrons. The museum design is a building form whose form, the architect says, is symbolic of both the rootedness and upward struggle of human rights. So these museums in Ottawa and Winnipeg represent a larger narrative that is still being constructed, namely about the role of the museum, the institution of the museum, both as a keeper of history and as a force to be continually redefining our Canadian culture. These projects certainly open up a larger debate on the place of museums in Canada, the play between the didactic and the advocate, and they, uh, are they repositories or do they represent aspirational notions? And this is a debate that still continues. So the second part of my chapter explained how architecture is used to reflect municipal governance and civic authority and the city's importance in promoting democracy. So my own work in Toronto's 1958 City Hall competition, and thank you again for, for highlighting that, Elsa, and the Massey Commission work brought me into the ideas of democratic expression in post-war architecture and civic space, particularly at the local level. Here, uh, the narrative is focused on the use of competitions for civic buildings and the importance of architecture to convey messages about civility, governance, and the necessity of an unfettered public realm. In my chapter, I discussed several city halls whose designs were the outcome of competitions. So we have uh, the Mississauga City Hall on the right in 1967 completed and the 1969 comp 19, excuse me, 89 competition of Kitchener City Hall. And one of the images is pictured outside in our atrium. And there are two important civic projects. Both are remarkable representations of the ambitions of their municipal leadership, not to mention the iconic architectural forms that resulted. Both uh, the Mississauga and Kitchener municipal buildings speak to the creation of civic space as much as the making of a monumental building. Kitchener reaffirms the importance of the city's main street, and Mississauga City Hall creates a new public place in this burgeoning city. The, these buildings tell us that the civic realm, both physically and notionally, is central to our daily life. Civic space and civic mindedness is also a theme of Peter Cardew's 1998 design for the Thompson Nicola Regional Civic Center building in Kamloops, British Columbia. The small building complex in, includes inside and outside civic spaces for public assembly and civic expression. <clears throat> 
I have a slide here on two buildings in uh, British Columbia, uh, the urbanization of the uh, Surrey, uh, Surrey Center by Bing Tom and the new city hall, which set as an anchor, um, um, which set as an anchor in a pedestrian-oriented downtown project. So my comment here on this section on civic architecture is with the proliferation of digital communications and our current setting aside of the face-to-face -face in our quotidian relationships, these projects optimistically tell us that the civic realm continues as an important part of the architectural project in Canada of the 21st century. The third aspect of institutional buildings I examined was how Canada presents itself in the world and to the world. Our nationalist Im uh, image is projected by our embassies abroad, our to participation in world's fairs globally, and the international events we've hosted at home. These buildings reflect a number of narratives about Canada and Canadians. Our the 1989 Canadian Embassy in Washington by Arthur Erickson carefully positioned itself on a prominent quarter along Pennsylvania Avenue and was mindful of the neoclassicism of Washington, but it also included some of Erickson's formal ideas through its horizontality and the creation of a landscaped area at ground level. The idea of a building mediating between the values of Canada and the host country is part of Erickson's design strategy, and I think is reflective of the underlying Canadian narrative that we all understand of peace, order, and good government. The strategy, of, the, the strategy of quiet insinuation is evident in many of Canada's embassies. Our Canadian Embassy in Chancery of 1991 in Tokyo, Japan, by Moriyama Tashima Architects, represents the principal elements of the Japanese art of flower arranging. And this is the narrative that the architect has presented and I'm describing in my chapter. Our embassy in Tokyo has a theater, a library, and an exhibition gallery. And this is part of, the, part of what our, our, our embassies are now doing abroad. The design is respectful of its host and quietly projects Canadian values of accommodation and modesty. And I know Marie-José -José Terrien is somewhere here, and she wrote a whole book about Canadian embassies. I don't see her at the moment, but voila, merci. What? <laughs> merci, merci, Marie Jose. So, nature is another theme that's reiterated in our embassies and chanceries abroad. We use natural Canadian materials in our embassies that reinforce the narrative of our country as a nature nation. Manitoba Tyndall limestone and a central atrium lined with British Columbia Douglas fir are key materials used in Canada House, the 1999 Canadian Embassy in Berlin. And Barbara Vogel, are you here, Barbara? Uh, she was invited tonight. She was one of the architects. She's a colleague of our faculty here at Ryerson, and I think she's the only Ryerson faculty member whose building appears. I know in my chapter, I don't know about the rest of the book. So um, thank you, Barbara. At the World's Fairs, we also present ourselves to, to Canada, to the world. Um, we have created some remarkable buildings in these World's Fairs, and pavilions, which are Ephemeral buildings provide an opportunity for creative expression, but here the expression reveals another narrative, a narrative that is about the way the building, building design thinking has changed over time. Architecture has shifted from the symbolic to the literal, in part a reflection of changing relationship of architecture to communications and information flows. That's something that Marco touched on in his presentation. World's fairs were once places of gathering and knowledge exchange. Now they've become places dominated by spectacle and presence. And these two pavilions uh, are examples of that. Ericsson's uh, and Massey's, uh, they won the competition for our pavilion at Expo 70 in Osaka. The pavilion is square in plan, enclosed by tall mirror sheathed walls that slope over an open a central courtyard. In the words of the architect, they create an ambiguity of scale, distance, position, and mass. The themes of landscape is symbolized here, and the pavilion makes reference to the landscape having multiple readings of sky, hill, solid void, arctic ice, mountain masses, and so forth. And Erickson also uses these rotating umbrellas. They're a nuanced homage to the fair's Japanese hosts. By contrast, the pavilion of Expo 92 in Seville is a rectangular box wrapped in Canadian zinc and aluminum. It's a warehouse building, a decorated shed, as was the fashion at the time. 
The interior relies upon the literal and romantic image, imagery, Canadian imagery, of a waterfall cascading into a pool, providing a respite to visitors from the hot Spanish summer sun. In the words of his visiting critic, the design did no more than co convey an old image of hewer of wood and draw of, of water, rather than a sophisticated, technically, technically adept, and socially concerned country. At home, where Canada has hosted an international event, architecture also plays a key role. And here, more we, here we see the development of other narratives. The first, the power of the quick, made-for-television image of heroic architecture is a trope for architecture of these events. And second, the narrative of costs, cost overruns, debt, and long-term liability. So in the media age, views of our cities, their urban forms, and their architecture become important backgrounds for these worldwide television audiences. Two buildings at Vancouver's, Vancouver's Expo 86 present a conundrum of designing for these lavish, large-scale, ephemeral events while creating per permanent, long-term leg legacies. Canada Place, on the left, uh, was designed as a multi-use building on Burrard Inlet, over half a mile long from the main, over half a mile from the main site. It was intentionally located and designed to be a legacy project after the exposition. By contrast, the CN Pavilion, which you see on the right, was designed to showcase the Canadian National Railways and was a whimsical standout. Reminiscent of British architect Cedric's priced unrealized design for a fun palace of the 1960s, the pavilion was an experiment in socially interactive architecture. Cardew's design, with its uncluttered stage, created an austere but simple space, a public space amid the exhibition's hubbub, and permitted a variety of public activities to occur. So the idea of permanence, legacy, ephemerality, and the price we pay for spectacular architecture are at play in the architecture of Canada hosting its Olympic Games. We like the Olympic gold, but what might the cost of this be? When Montreal won the bid to host its 1976 Summer Olympics, the city's mayor turned to French architect Roger, uh, Robert Taibert, and there's Mayor Drapeau himself with the, the model of the um, building by Taibert. Taibert worked to execute the main sports facilities for Montreal's games. The Olympic Stadium and the Velodrome are two of the buildings he designed for the Olympics. These legacy buildings encapsulate the problem. On one hand, there's a stadium that never really worked properly. And on the other hand, there's the velodrome. Uh, you can see that on the right when it was in use at the Olympics. And it found a future structure when it was converted to the Biodome, a museum of ecology, which is a major contemporary attraction in Montreal. We see success on one hand and failure on the other. For our Winter Olympic Games in Calgary and Vancouver, organizers planned smaller scaled facilities that would find extensive after game use. Both games developed partnerships with local institutions, dovetailing Olympic facilities with needed new developments. Vancouver's 2010 Winter Olympics continued this modest is better theme. And the organizers used these public-private partnerships, P3s, for financing and constructing facilities and leveraged the games to support development in new urban areas and the revitalization of obsolete industrial zones. This is the Richmond Olympic Oval, purpose-built. It's a significant le legacy of Vancouver's games. Hopefully, the architectural legacy of these recent events will support future generations of Canadian athletes and help keep us all fit. So the final group of projects in, in my architecture, on my chapter on architecture of Canadian institutions, turns to the role played by infrastructure and nation building, and nation building excuse me, nation building. And here I wanted to ask Leo to, to, to play some Gordon Lightfoot early morning rain or maybe the Canadian Railroad Trilogy, but I wasn't technically adept to get him to do that or at least to organize that or even talk about the poetry of the RCAF pilot John Gillespie from the Second War. These cultural works pay, play homage to the forces of nation building, the railroad and the airplane, and they're spoken in narratives that we understand of the iron spike or the poetry of a high flight. Ottawa's Union Station was the last great modern railroad station built here in Canada. Ottawa's new Union Station uh, symbolized the important instrument of national unity. 
The portal, it, was, it presents a wonderful portal. And those of you who've taken the train and arrived in Ottawa find that they have that discovery when you come through this, the gates of that portal, and come into the space of Union Station in Ottawa. On the other hand, we have Montreal's Mirabelle Airport, YMX, <laughs> which captures the glamour of that time. No face masks, no security, no hands, hand sanitizer. Um, it opened in 1975. It ceased operating in Mont as Montreal's International Gateway in 1997 and was demolished altogether in 2016. Nonetheless, and this is your tax dollars at work, we still continue to build these portals. Large-scale terminals such as Toronto's Terminal 1 serve an ever-increasing appetite for our, quick, for our, our appetite for quick travel. And we even see in small regional airports such as the the elegant terminal for Prince George Airport, YXS, uh, which was prompted by a national program to, con to upgrade Canadian airports and re represents these national institutions from the smallest to the largest cities. So I'd like to conclude with um, uh, a few thoughts. Um, this has been, excuse me, a very quick overview of the ways that Canada has presented itself through the architecture of its institutions and my own interpretation of the underlying narratives that these may represent. The Massey's Commission rec recommendations continue to resonate the power of creative and beautiful contemporary architecture. And I'll end here on a rather troubling and interesting note. I recently received a, notif a notification about a draft executive order for, uh, emanating from the USA White, White House. This this executive order proposes to designate classical architecture as the preferred style for US federal buildings. Critics are appalled. It's an idea, they say, that would roll back federal architecture by nearly 60 years, altering a long-standing policy in the USA that, place, that places emphasis on designs that embody the finest contemporary, and in their case, American architecture. So my commentary tonight has not discussed political interference in architectural matters. We've seen plenty of those. And this is a narrative that underlies many of these federally supported uh, Canadian projects, mostly in the museum's areas. My review, therefore, is presented to both architects and our students and the public at large as a cautionary tale. Well, you may choose to like or dislike the many institutional buildings that I've presented, they are indicative of the lively forces at work architecturally in Canada today. Perhaps the idea, and this is the powerful idea, the powerful emotion that architecture may convey and the inventive create, creative force of the architect, this may be the single overriding narrative I hope that you'll take away with you as you carry this hefty volume which I meant to lift up here, uh, which some said makes a very good doorstop if you, uh, after you've read it. And it won't be on the final exam for those of you in my class. Um, so let's hope that the next 50 years will see the continuation of this vibrant energy. And thank you once again. Ten to eight. <laughs> so maybe I'll invite uh, Marco, and in, I would say that in lieu of a panel, then maybe we can invite some questions from the floor. Um, and if there's no no questions, I'll launch a question or two out there, uh, but to so that we have time to enjoy the amazing spread that's out there. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Jake uh, Dennis Murray, Yeah. Hey, Jake. Jake. Uh, and uh, I remember still the first, uh, one of the first projects that he had us do, he asked us to write a question. The question was about the importance of the picturesque. What do you think of the, the, the picturesque? We were kids, I mean, you know, coming into our kids' school and the picturesque. And I, 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 I still, I still uh, struggle with the question of the picturesque. But I, I would like to turn it to the three of you to address the question of the picturesque, not just in Canadian architecture, but specifically in the book that you've done. Because, because it, it, it strikes me that you've, you've made a, a real attempt to, and uh, I think uh, you, you address that in, the, in that 
discussion of the very carefully uh, poised photograph in Ottawa. Uh, 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 maybe you addressed it in your discussion of the spectacle uh, when you talked about this, the, the architecture in Seville. Um, uh, but I, I, it does strike me as interesting. We don't have a lot of architectural plans or sections in the book. And I, and I, I feel as though that may be um, something that uh, might want to be addressed. Or, 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 or uh, I, I'm pushing that. So, yeah. so if, if I could just jump in for a few. So for those of you, the picturesque is my understanding of the picturesque is that it's a notion in landscape architecture that evolved in the 19th century about creating a picture of the landscape. And this was, this was formally represented by much of the early 19th century landscapes, Hem Humphrey Repton and others, who established points of view within a composition where you would understand the space. So, so the picturesque is a concept of buildings in space and buildings in place. And I appreciate that many of the buildings that, that have been presented in this, at least in this brief kind of overview, talk about the buildings themselves and not necessarily about the spaces that they might engage or the context within which they engage. I know that that's in the book because I know that many of the architects are there, uh, many of the works are there. The other concept that I think that I just want to briefly address before I let somebody else jump in is the idea of plans and sections. Uh, the idea of space is, is certainly revealed in the presentation of a plan and section. And I appreciate that very much. To, um, and this, I think, would see a comment that I would put on, Elda's, on, on Elsa's uh, shoulders, would be about how do you represent ideas of architecture? Do you represent them through pictures of spaces without people in them? Do you represent them with uh, plans and sections? Or do you try to convey the messages that these buildings may have represented either in their conception or their completion? So I'll leave it at that, but that's my kind of jump in comment. Yeah, and on I mean, you know, part of it is about the, you know, I guess like making, like making architecture, you know, part of making a book is, um, is an iterative process of, you know, having an idea of what the book is going to be. And then, you know, you start to shape up the text, get the text in, you know, the chapters and figure out, you know, what material actually are working with in terms of the visuals that you have at hand. Um, and then, you know, you start working with a graphic designer in terms of, of the layouts and so on. And, you know, when things kind of, they shape up maybe differently than you had originally envisaged. And when we had first planned this book, we actually had a kind of visit, uh, vision that each chapter would have, um, would, you know, have, have text or pictures that ran alongside the text. And then it would have like five case studies, like five buildings that were kind of pulled out as like double page spreads with more images and indeed with plans and sections uh, to represent them in a more kind of comprehensive way. Um, and those would be kind of have a different kind of graphic treatment. Um, but as we were pulling the book together, we just didn't have kind of consistent enough material uh, in all the chapters to actually make that happen. So, you know, so there was a, a, an ambition, I would say, and, uh, and a kind of acknowledgement of the importance of plans and sections. Um, but, uh, but it just, it didn't come through in this book. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to come back to the question about the picturesque, because I think that, as, as you pointed out, in the case of the brutalist uh, architecture that was primarily landscape oriented, I think that is a kind of more contemporary interpretation of the picturesque in the sense that it, it still operates from that idea of irregularity in form, of a kind of ruggedness, um, landscape oriented sort of ruggedness. And one of the interesting things that you know, we didn't get into, the, into tonight and not even so much in the chapter itself, but um, in Canada, brutalism seems to operate very much as a kind of extension of landscape or a representation of landscape. So you either have projects that are uh, some of the mega projects, for example, that um, that um, uh, Elsa alluded to in the George Baird chapter. Um, some of those uh, projects are very strongly related to particular landscapes, and they embrace and respond to those landscapes, and to a large extent try to present themselves as kind of equal to the landscape. They're muscular, they're enormous in scale. Um, the other end of that are urban buildings that at some level deny their urbanity and create a foil to the urban mm -hmm. fabric by creating a kind of la almost landscape intervention. The National Arts Centre, I think, is one such example. In Ottawa, if you think of Place Bonaventure in Montreal, it's like a cliff has been dropped into the middle of the city. Um, so I, I think in that sense, the picturesque continues to play through in this, in this, in the 60s and 70s period of, of brutalism in Canada. 
And in Canada, I would say that brutalism, unlike in some, of the, some other manifestations of brutalism, especially in Europe, um, takes on this very kind of landscape-related orientation. We see it in the Calgary Planetarium that when, when photographed, and again, very deliberately photographed from certain angles, it kind of looks like the Rocky Mountains, right? So, so there is this very strong um, representation of landscape through, through the architecture. We have another question, and we'll uh, give the priority to any students in the room that ha have a question. Perhaps. Okay, we can we can move the age bar up. There's other questions there. <laughs> Graduate students, <laughs> <laughs> lifelong students. Sure, Marie Jolie. I'm quite impressed by uh, the book launch, your series of book launch. That, I mean, I had my spy in Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they did ask you, they did ask the people on the panel over there, why did you use the word modern without explaining? the meaning of modern architecture, because obviously it's more about contemporary architecture. So could you expand on that, please? Yeah, I mean, you know, in a way it's a shorthand, right? We use it as a shorthand for modern and contemporary architecture, basically. Um, I, I, I mean, the, the, I don't know if you're, how much your, your spy reported back. <laughs> I mean, the full title of this book should be something like, you know, Canadian modern and contemporary architecture, or Cana modern and contemporary architecture in Canada, mostly by Canadian architects, also including some buildings by Canadian architects working abroad. <laughs> yeah. I think that offends me a bit in your presentation tonight, to, to both you, Marshall, and, and George, and your friends, and all that, is that, just to remind you, the mass you report is actually the mass you report. And if you are to talk about <laughs> so, uh, some of us had Massey Levesque, but it got edited out, so there you have it. Well, no, so it, it, it does appear as Massey Levesque in the book, but it's bad habit to, short, to shorthand it. We have two more to get it right, Ottawa City Hall and Banff Session, so as long as, uh, yeah, as, as COVID-19 doesn't cancel them. So. Yeah. Maybe we'll take one more question and then just so that we're not tortured in this hot room for too long. Yeah. Um, the, the choice of the essays, uh, the authors, and the order that you placed in, how early on did you guys select that? Did that happen naturally to the book? Yeah, so the, the choice of the authors happened quite early on. I mean, basically, uh, Graham Livesey and I developed the, the kind of outline, and we started grouping crop projects in various ways. Um, and, and, and we kind of developed, yeah, we basically developed the outline of the book and kind of developed like a little paragraph on each chapter and what we thought, the direction we thought it might take, um, and, and a kind of list of projects that we thought might go in that chapter. Um, and uh, then we started approaching the authors right off uh, after that. So that part happened early on. Um, the final order of the chapters happened much later, actually. So, you know, the kind of, uh, and the division of the four categories, it was, it was kind of, we were shuffling it as we got the chapters in and as we, uh, figured out how they might uh, best be presented together. So there were some chapters that slipped between one section and the other, and it was really only at the, you know, in the very later stages, uh, before we went to graphic layout, of figuring out, okay, this is the final table of contents for the book. Yeah. Okay. Bef before we close, I just wanted to say that our next lecture is a lecture that involves architecture and landscape, and we'll talk about it's Richard Strong um, and John Andrews, and it's a lecture given by Philip Goad, who is an architectural historian currently from Australia, but who's currently on leave at Harvard. So we will have a continuation of that discussion of buildings in the landscape the next time. Right. Um, and so I'd like to thank the panelists. I'd like to invite everybody to enjoy the reception, to enjoy the photos, uh, you know, buy a book if you don't already have one, and we're, we'll be available to sign books if you are a kind of person that likes your books. Yes. Mind. Thank you. And oh, oh, one sec. Oh, yeah. Good. And and, be, and before the reception, um, we'd like to thank you also for 
um, helping to organize this event. And this is a really important event for our community and in particular our students. And we have two student ambassadors that would like to say a few words. We would like to thank you on behalf of the student body of the Department of Architectural Science. As a token of gratitude, we present you with the latest edition of the 365 Magazine, a curated collection of student work. Uh, George and Marco and um, the, le the rest of the lecture committee would also like to thank you, and this is a small token for all of us. Go eat. Go eat, go drink. Go buy books. And, and buy books. <laughs> thank you.